Good morning and welcome to worship at St. Andrew Lutheran Church as we rejoice in the resurrection of our Savior Jesus from the dead. Following the rather somber and subdued worship of this past week, Holy Week, especially uh, remembering that it is our sins that caused Jesus to give up his life to suffer so greatly on the cross. Today on Easter, we rejoice to see him risen from the dead, to have the assurance that because he lives, we also will live. That although our bodies may die, unless we are still living when Jesus returns on the last day, yet he has promised that by his victory over death, he will also raise up back to life and, and glorify and perfect us for eternal life with him for all those who believe in him as their Savior. All this is God's amazing grace to us, and for that grace, we rejoice today. We join together in our opening hymn, Jesus Christ is Risen Today, on page three in the service folder. May God bless our worship. stand. We join in the spoken responses on page four in the service folder. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. risen This is the day the Lord has made. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. I will not die, but live, and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord's right hand is majestic in power. The Lord's right hand has shattered the enemy. In the greatness of his majesty, he threw down those who opposed him. 
Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. Alleluia! Christ is risen! Let us pray. O God, you made the dawn of this most holy day shine with the glory of our Lord's resurrection. Grant that we who have been raised from the death of sin by your life-giving Spirit may worship you in sincerity and truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading from God's Word for our meditation this morning is from the book of Job in the Old Testament, Job chapter 19, verses 23 through 27. 
Here we find the uh, scriptural basis for that cherished Easter hymn, I Know That My Redeemer Lives. If you recall the life of Job, uh, he was greatly afflicted in life. Uh, all of his, his wealth was taken from him, and his children, all ten of his children, died tragically in an accident when the house that they were in collapsed upon them and killed them all. And then finally, Job's health was taken as his body uh, was racked with illness and painful sores. But through it all, in the, in the depth of his sorrow and pain and suffering, he maintained his faith in God and expressed uh, in these words that have become words of, of great comfort and, and strength and confidence for so many Christians, his confidence in God's promise of the Savior. But even if finally his own life ends, he is confident that God, through the Savior, will raise him back to life, to live forever with God in heaven. We read now from Job chapter 19. Oh, how I wish that my words were written down. Oh, how I wish that they were inscribed in bronze, that they would be engraved in rock forever with an iron tool and letters filled with lead. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that at the end of time he will stand over the dust. Then, even after my skin has been destroyed, nevertheless, in my own flesh I will see God. I myself will see him. My own eyes will see him, and not as a stranger. My emotions are in turmoil within me. This is the word of the Lord. We join now to sing the psalm of the day, Psalm 30, on pages 6 and 7 in the service folder. verse of the day is from Psalm 118. Alleluia, alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Alleluia. Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. The Holy Gospel for the festival of the resurrection of our Lord is written in the Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 16. When the Sabbath was passed, 
Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so they could go and anoint Jesus. Very early on the first day of the week, at sunrise, they went to the tomb. They were saying to each other, Who will roll the stone away from the entrance to the tomb for us? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. He said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. They went out and hurried away from the tomb, trembling and perplexed. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. After Jesus had risen early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and reported to those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. When they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe it. After these things, Jesus appeared in, in another form to two of them as they were walking along on their way to the country. These two also returned and reported it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table. He rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated for our next hymn, The Day of Resurrection, on page 9 in the service folder. And the New Testament epistle reading upon which we will meditate in the sermon is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through 26, the great resurrection chapter of the Bible. The Apostle Paul is writing, assuring the believers in the Greek city of Corinth and all believers ever afterwards, including us today, that Jesus has indeed risen from the dead. And that means for us, resurrection from death as well. Now, if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, 
How is it that some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is pointless, and your faith is pointless too. Then we are even guilty of giving false testimony about God, because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it were true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then it also follows that those who fell asleep in Christ perished. If our hope in Christ applies only to this life, we are the most pitiful people of all. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came by a man, the resurrection of the dead also is going to come by a man. For as in Adam they all die, so also in Christ they all will be made alive, but each in his own order, Christ as the firstfruits, and then Christ's people at his coming. Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has done away with every other ruler and every other authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Death is the last enemy to be done away with. This is the word of the Lord. And we join now to sing the hymn of the day, Awake My Heart with Gladness, on page 11 in the service folder.
portion of God's Word for our special meditation this morning is the New Testament epistle reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through 26. You can find those verses again on pages 9 and 10 in the service folder. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. No one will ever be able to to truly understand or feel the emotions that those first disciples felt on that first Easter. Think about the despair and the despondency after Jesus' death on the cross on Good Friday. That feeling had to be far worse than any of the agony that we feel at the loss of a loved one. And I know that so many of you here know the depth of of that feeling of grief at the loss of a loved one. But for those disciples, Jesus was more than just a loved one, more than even the, the closest of loved ones or family members. Jesus was one whom they had come to know and believe in as their Lord and their Savior. And so it was not just that a dear loved one had now been separated from them by death, but that all of their hope and their trust and their their whole entire lives as followers of him were now completely shattered. And so it's a wonder then that those 11 disciples didn't follow Judas into utter despair during that time between Friday afternoon and Sunday morning. Now, when the disciples on Sunday were able to say, we have seen the Lord, that was news that was difficult for the others who had not yet seen him to believe. It required a total change in their way of thinking. They had only just begun to get used to the idea that Jesus was dead and that he was separated from them. And so we can understand why at first the Apostle Thomas didn't believe until he saw for himself and until he was able to put his finger into the nail wounds in Jesus' hands and the spear wound in his side. But then when he did see, he fell down in humble awe with the simple words, My Lord and my God. He and the others saw how how that death of Jesus had been turned into a victory. How that death was necessary in order that victory over death for all people might be won. And it was a hard-earned victory indeed. It was a life and death victory. And that is the real message of Easter for us that Christ has earned a victory over life and death by becoming for us the Lord of life and death. It makes all the difference in the world that Christ is arisen and alive. He has proven himself to be victorious over death. As our text reminds us, he has destroyed that last enemy, death itself. And as the Apostle Paul reminds us in another place, he has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light. There are those, even today, who call themselves Christians, yet who, who nevertheless say that it's not really necessary to believe that Jesus actually rose from the dead. You can still be a Christian and, and not really believe that the, the resurrection of Jesus actually happened. They say it's just enough that Jesus' spirit of love and and of self-sacrifice lives among us and and in our relationships with each other. And just believing that and having that good feeling towards each other is enough to make us Christian. But according to God's word through his apostle Paul, we see that that is not enough. Not if our lives are going to have true purpose and power from God. It is not enough if we are going to call Jesus our Lord and our Savior. To be our Lord, he must be a living Lord. And that is precisely the Easter message. We have a living Lord 
one who has lived our life, lived a perfect life in our place, and who has died the death that we deserve to show us that our existence now through him has eternal significance. He lived our life in order that he might die our death so that we might be alive with him now and forever. But more than that, Jesus has not only identified himself completely with our life and death, but we are completely identified with his life and death also. He died and rose again for us, and we die and rise again with him. As the Apostle Paul writes, as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. And all of this started at our baptism. Remember the Apostle Paul's words in Romans chapter 6. He says, Don't you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of God the Father, we too might live a new life. For if we have been united with him in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. We know that our old self, the sinful nature, has been crucified with him so that the sinful nature might be destroyed and we might no longer be slaves to sin. For whoever has died has been freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that Christ has been raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. And so you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Those words from Romans chapter 6, just by themselves, make a powerful Easter sermon. And the picture that the Apostle Paul is trying to paint there is this, that through baptism, we died. Our old self has died, and, and we have been raised together with Jesus to new life. We lost that old way of life that we lived apart from God, and, and by ourselves, if, if we were ever to have life again, that life would have to be restored in us, brought back to us. We couldn't earn it or get it by ourselves, but Christ came to restore that life to us once again. As the Apostle Paul writes in our reading, as in Adam, the first sinner, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all will be made alive. Through the sin of Adam and Eve, paradise had been lost. But through Jesus, paradise has been restored. In Adam, we learned the meaning of sorrow and disappointment and failure. But in Christ, we find hope, and joy, and victory. In Adam, we see selfishness and greed become a part of our life, but in Christ, we have power again to love and to serve. In Adam, life took on a, a meaninglessness and a lostness, but in Christ, it is restored again to purpose and direction. In Christ, all have been made alive. But the picture that the Apostle Paul paints for us in our text is even greater than that. When it speaks about finding life in Christ, it's not talking about only the, the relatively few years that we live on this side of eternity. It's also talking about the life that we find even in the face of our physical death. Easter makes life worth living by giving our life a new direction. But Easter also makes death worth dying by giving it a new dimension as well. 
No outlook on life could possibly be complete unless it gives us an answer to this universal experience, the experience of death. It's an experience that is such a very lonely one because In the the final moment, we must face death all alone. And unless we have an answer to this final and, and terrifying experience of life, then we have a religion that is, in the end, inadequate and, and ultimately lets us down. As the Apostle Paul writes, if if only in this life we have hope in Christ, then we are the most pitiful of all people. But thank God that that is not the case because Christ Jesus has indeed been raised from the dead as the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And here we see that one of the, the word pictures that the New Testament uses again and again referring to death as simply asleep with a waking up at the dawn of a new day. And so instead of an agonizing and and fearful prospect, instead of a cruel and senseless end to to young and hopeful lives, instead of the result of relentless wearing out and, and deterioration of our bodies that have lived 70 or 80 or 90 years, now death for a Christian is more just like taking a nap, like laying aside the problems pains, and turmoils of the day, and going to sleep in the confidence that because Christ lives, we too will live. And that is a hope that has carried many Christians victoriously and triumphantly across that threshold of death. Yes, we experience death alone, but we are not going through unexplored territory. Jesus has gone through that territory before, and he has come out victorious on the other side, and now he beckons us onward so that even though we pass through the valley of the shadow of death, we need fear no evil because he is with us. His rod and his staff comfort us. This is our hope as we face death ourselves, whether in the near or distant future. This is our comfort as we face also the death of a loved one. What do you tell parents who have just lost a child? Or people whom senseless tragedies have struck? What do you say to them in in the depth of their grief and pain? Well, the Christian religion has something to say. It doesn't tell us that to be a Christian means that death will never come to us or to our loved ones. On the other hand, it, it reminds us that death is universal because of sin, that it strikes at, at any and all ages in many different ways, and eventually, unless our Savior returns on the last day first, it will come to all of us. Christian religion does not promise that death will be eliminated. Rather, it provides the answer to death. It enables us to look right through it and right past it because the Lord Jesus in whom we trust has experienced it already for us so that he could conquer it for us. So this, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead has tremendous significance for our living and for our dying, for life and for death. Because he is the Lord of both life and death. The great apostle who wrote these words, the apostle Paul, knew what it meant to live in the power of Jesus' resurrection. He spoke of it often in his writings. In Romans chapter 14, He said, It is for this reason that Christ has died and lived again, so that he might be the Lord both of the dead and of the living. The victory of Jesus Christ at Easter is also our victory. Nothing, God assures us, 
absolutely nothing, neither death nor life nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, the the victory of Easter, makes it possible for us both to live and to die victoriously. And to be able to live and to die victoriously means in the fullest sense to know what it means to live. Amen. And we join now to sing our next hymn on page 14 in the service folder, hymn 341, Crown Him with Many Crowns. for misdirecting you just now. We'll get to crown him with many crowns in just a moment. And we now bring our offerings from thankful hearts to our Savior God.
And I invite you to join now in confessing the Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed as printed on page 13 in the service folder. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now we join to sing, Crown Him with Many Crowns, hymn 341, on page 14 in the service folder. stand for prayer. We follow the responsive prayer as printed beginning at the top of page 15 in the service folder. Heavenly Father, God of grace, you have brought us into a new and living hope by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. For as in Adam all died, so in Christ all will be made alive. He was delivered over to death for our sins and raised to life for our justification. We marvel at the love you showed by your willingness to sacrifice your son to pay for our sins. We bow down in adoration at your mighty power, which raised him from the dead. Lord Jesus, God of grace, You have filled our hearts with resurrection joy by your victory over sin, death, and the grave. We 
with the church of every age, we offer you unending praise, for you have crushed Satan's head and have removed our guilt. Dear Savior, we who are weary and burdened come to you for rest, knowing that because of your perfect redemption, there is now no condemnation for us. Take away our doubts and fears and daily renew in us the joy of our salvation. Holy Spirit, God of grace, you have called us by the gospel and brought us to saving faith in our risen Lord. Keep us with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. As we journey through life, make us yearn for the day when you will give eternal life to us and all believers in Christ. Lord of the Church, you have entrusted us with the responsibility of making disciples of all nations. Open our eyes to see the need for workers. Inspire young people to consider a career as a pastor, teacher, or staff minister. Provide parents with words that encourage their children to consider full-time gospel ministry. Also, move adults to consider a second career path to ministry, according to your will. Help our synod and congregations best utilize the workers with which we are blessed, and move us to value them and their ministries. Use us, Lord, to share the good news of salvation in Christ Jesus with our communities. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you would pour out your blessings on Jade Christofiak, the daughter-in-law of our friend and neighbor Kathleen, who has uh, been struggling with metastatic cancer. We pray that you would be with her and bless the treatment that she is receiving. Watch over her husband and her children and all of their family and their loved ones and friends. We pray that you would give them strength and comfort through the assurance of the full forgiveness of, of all of their sins and of your promise of eternal life with you through Jesus, their Savior. We ask that you would continue to watch over our sister in Christ, Stacy, as she continues to undergo intensive chemotherapy and radiation treatment and faces up multiple upcoming surgeries also to treat the metastatic cancer that has spread throughout her body. We pray that you would bless that treatment that she is receiving and that you would relieve any uh, pain and, and discomfort and side effects that she may be experiencing. And when the time comes soon for surgeries uh, to happen, we pray that you would guide and bless the doctors who carry out those surgeries. We pray for, for your blessing for success and for healing and recovery and for strength and, and comfort and encouragement for the road that lies ahead for Stacy. We give thanks to you together with our brother in Christ, Jason, that he has received word from his doctor that uh, as of now, no more chemotherapy is, is, appears to be needed for him. We thank you for that good news and we pray that you would uh, bless the results of the test that he will soon undergo to, to check again to see whether there is any cancer uh, that is still left in his body. We ask for your continued blessing on our brother, Rich, um, as he also continues to recover from chemotherapy treatment and other health complications, we pray for your blessing and strength for him. For all of our, our family members and loved ones and friends, members of our congregation and, and members of our extended families who are, are struggling with illness or injury or, or other health problems or other difficulties in life, we pray for your blessing, for your healing, for your strengthening and your hope, all through the good news of the resurrection of your son, Jesus, our Savior. And hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Work through us as we proclaim the saving message of the crucified and risen Jesus near and far, so that many others may hear your call, obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus, and join us before the throne of our God and of the Lamb. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, by the glory you conquered death and opened the gate to eternal life, grant that we who have been raised with him through baptism may walk in the newness of life and ever rejoice in the hope of sharing his glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be dominion and praise now and forever. Amen. Now may the God of peace, who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, in connection with his blood which established the eternal testament, may he equip you with every good thing to do his will, as he works in us what is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. To him be glory forever and ever. as you're able, I invite you to remain standing for our closing hymn, I Know That My Redeemer Lives, and we invite the children of our children's choir to come forward as they will sing stanza one of the hymn, and then the congregation will join in stanzas two through eight.
may be seated. Welcome again to all of you. A special welcome to our guests who are with us this morning. It's a joy to worship our God together with you this Easter day. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Invite all of you to stay for fellowship and for food after the service is over. There's plenty of food for all who would like to stay. And uh, if you need to get going, that's okay too. Uh, but introduce yourselves to those who are around you if you, don't, if you don't know those sitting near you. And you're very welcome to join us for worship again next Sunday as we continue with our Easter celebration. May God be with you the rest of today and this coming week.